Okay, we will start in a minute. Okay, I'm going to turn the attendance on. Uh, please sign in now. Okay. All right, let's get started. Uh, any questions before we get started? Anything before we get started? All right. Um, I'd like to start class today by reviewing um, our last two topics, which were Korematsu and Youngstown, these two very important cases. And I think these cases illustrate one aspect of the class that might be a little bit unconventional. Um, you learn um, constitutional law by topic. You don't learn it chronologically. Um, there might be an advantage to teaching chronologically. Indeed, the first edition of Randy's casebook was sequential, that you started with the 1800s and you went to the present. Um, the book didn't work for a lot of reasons, which I can explain another time. But one of the difficulties of this sort of topical approach is you jump around. In that you first do Young Sound, which was 1952, and then you jump back in time to Karamatsu, which was 1944. Um, when Korematsu was decided, you didn't know about Youngstown yet, right? You don't have the benefit of, of, of uh, uh, telling the future when you decide cases. So someone asked, you know, how, Josh, could Korematsu be reconciled with Youngstown? It's a bit of a, of a false question because it came eight years beforehand. Now, the challenge for you as a law student is how to understand how doctrine existed at a given point in time. Um, on the exam, which I told you about before, uh, I always ask two questions. Um, one question is based on describe the law that exists today in the year 2020. And the other question is you're at some point in time in the past. Maybe I'll make it 1944 or 1952 or 1937, whatever year I decide it happens, you know, different year every year. And you have to train yourself to not look ahead. Right, to not jump ahead, to not try to view old law through the lens of the modern stuff. So if you're in the progressive era, you should not view it as if you're the New Deal court. Or for the 1960s, you don't know what happened yet in the Rehnquist court during the 1990s. You, don't, you just don't know. Um, constitutional law is a bit like a puzzle where I give you the pieces sort of out of order and that's up to you to sort of put them together in your, in your own outlines. Uh, uh, from start to finish. Okay? Does that, does that make sense? It's always a tricky concept. All right. All right. Um, so, so let's do some questions then to review um, how well you grasp uh, Korematsu and Youngstown. Uh, so let's try a poll question. Let me bring up the polling app. And uh, here's the, I'll put the link to the, to the class notes in the chat. Okay. Um, so the first question I have is question number one. This will be a short answer. I'm looking for one word. In the first zone of Justice Jackson's concurrence, Courts review the government's action with the presumption of blank. A presumption of blank. Looking for one word. Okay. Whoever's next, please raise your hand.
Oh, I'm sorry. I put the property notes. I apologize. Here is the um, correct notes. I apologize for that. It was my link to my previous class on the clipboard. All right, James, what's your answer here? Uh, constitutionality. Okay, that's right. Oh, you're outside. Oh, good. What? What? I guess the building's closed. That's right. What's a presumption of constitutionality, James? Uh, the president has. Well, they think he can do it. Simply. What do you um, mean he, the president can do it? Just, just be a little more precise. Whatever power or thing he's trying to accomplish, they assume that that is constitutional. Okay, no. Nope. His powers and the implied or expressed authorization of Congress. Very good. Now, why do courts apply the presumption of constitutionality, James, in the first Youngstown zone? Why is that um, presumption because, warranted? Because he's it's an expressor implied by the other branch by Congress, mm -hmm. and it has all the his powers plus the powers granted him by the Congress. You're really close. You're almost done, James. Why would the court not want to intervene when you have the Congress and the President lining up? Why might the court say, you know, this is not for us to second guess if the other branches are in agreement? Well, because Congress has either said that he can do it mm -hmm. or has implied that he can do it. Good. And it not, then that's within his, they assume that's within his own power. You're telling me the same thing you said before, but why would the, why would the court not want to intervene in those cases? What's the, what's the rationale? Lawfully? Why, why would courts not want to intervene? That's the question. It's a, it's a policy or a question. Because that's not their role. Yes. Good. More. That's it. G give me a little bit more, please. Uh, What's the role of the courts? They, to decide whether one of somebody's violating their constitutional powers. Oh, you're so close. Just you're, you're, you're just like an inch away. Or Bianca, violating the constitution. No, you're, you're, you're give me legal. I'm asking for like a policy type question. Uh, Bianca, are you here? Bianca. Yes, I'm here. Why would the courts not want to get involved in these sorts of cases when the president and the, and the Congress are all in agreement? Um, what role do the courts play in our three system, three branches of government? The judicial. Oh yeah, the judicial. But how would you characterize the court in relation to the other branches? They enact statutes that would statutes that would give power to the other branches. Oh man, you're not seeing this. All right, I'll I'll help you out. Uh, this is a very important point. Uh, law students don't like policy questions. It's just it's, I'm not picking on James and Bianca. You just have to be next on the roll. Um, the answer is accountability. Right, the president's elected. Members of Congress are elected. Right, those are the branches that are accountable to the people. The courts are not accountable. By, by definition, they're not. They're designed to be independent. And the court says, look, if the elected branches are okay with this, then the unelected court should not intervene. They should not try to, try to mess this up. Right? That's why you have deference. Right? It's not because Congress is necessarily smarter or they know about the law. It's that they're accountable. And if the both of the accountable branches are in agreement, then the people can decide if those are proper actions or not. Yeah, and again, I, I didn't mean to pick on James or Bianca, but I think this is a concept law students just don't get because they just presume that courts are all powerful, right? You don't think about the Congress. Um, you don't think about the legislature. All you know is judges, and they can do whatever the hell they want. Uh, and that well, shouldn't be the right answer. Maybe it is, but it shouldn't be. Um, the Jackson framework, I think, is so significant because it puts a thumb on the scale, so to speak. It sort of gives an advantage to the government when they get their act together, when they, when they act in cooperation. Jackson had worked in the executive branch. He knew this very well. He's like, look, if the political branches are figuring out a solution for this, for this crisis, this steel seizure, right? Who are we to second guess them? But in that case, they did not work out a deal. 
Congress did not give the president the power to seize the mills. And President Truman said, all right, YOLO, I'm going to do it myself, right? Um, and he, he went unilateral. And in that case, Jackson had no problem saying you can't do that. But had you fallen instead of in the third zone, had you fallen to the first zone, Jackson would be like, oh, all right, you, you got it, you can do it. Right, the president has his power. So if you can get that point, this is a very common theme that I, um, oh, Aaron, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll come back to you in a second, I didn't mean to skip you. Um, this is a very common theme uh, in constitutional law cases, right? What is the role of the courts in our republic? Right? You know, what things should the courts decide and what things should the legislature decide? Um, you cannot presume, you can't assume that the courts can decide any question they want. I, I, I hope they don't. There's some things that courts should not decide. Um, even in Marbury, at the very beginning, the, the Chief Justice said there are certain political questions that it's not for the courts, right? Let the political branches handle this. So this is a common theme. I'm actually glad we had this little discussion here. But the Jackson presumption of constitutionality, the deference is based on accountability. Think of the New Deal cases, right? After Darby and Wickard and Jones and Laughlin Steele. The court said, look, if the government has some rational basis to decide that this is a necessary a regulation of interstate commerce, who are we to second guess them? Right? It's not our job. We don't have to decide if this is a direct effect in commerce or indirect effect. If this is something that Congress thinks is good and the president signs into law, that's good enough for us. Right? It's about deference, it's about accountability. Think of the Korematsu case, right? They said, look, we don't have all the intelligence on national security. We don't know what the espionage threats are. If the president and Congress uh, uh, think that this this order, this 9066, is a good idea, who are we to decide? Right, actually, take a look at question number two. I think it's actually a good segue. Let's see if you see if we can get this one right. Um, this is question number two. It says, uh, just assume that Korematsu was decided after Youngstown. It obviously wasn't, right? It's a it's a counterfactual because so I'm making it up. But assume that Korematsu came after Youngstown. What zone would Executive Order 9066 have fallen into? And I'll call on Aaron for this next one. I, I didn't mean to skip you. I apologize. I always appreciate when students tell me I skipped them because you just see the opposite. Like, oh, thank God he skipped me. Uh, it, it, it's not deliberate. I, I try to do the best I can. All right. All right, Aaron. Uh, oh, I skipped long. Oh, I know what happened. James got too eager and he, uh, I skipped both Lauren and Aaron. Okay, so I'll, Aaron, I'll call on you for this one. Lauren, you're on next. Um, so, Aaron, what's your answer? <laughs> James swiped it. That's funny. All right, uh, Aaron, what's your answer here? How would we characterize the Youngstown, uh, the Korematsu case, if it came before, after Youngstown? How would we characterize it? Yeah, what zone would, would, would the executive order fall into? Zone three. Why do you say zone three? Um, because I know that he has the executive power, um, but as far as like statute, I don't think Congress like expressly said to ooh, hey, ooh. go exclude expressly. Yes. Is 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 Youngstown limited to express delegations of power? No, it what? has to be implied. Oh. But I think because uh, Korematsu dealt with racial discrimination, they had to. I mean, this kind of answer is number three, so I probably won't say. Well, but. no, you're actually doing exactly what I, thought, I hoped you would do, which is it's actually not correct, but it's good that you're doing it. Um, the Jackson framework is not based on the racial classification. All right, so thanks, Aaron. That's actually very good. You, you, you teed up exactly what I was thinking about, right? Um, I'm not going to give you the answer to number two yet. I want you to answer number three first. So see question number three. Question number three is, it's a short answer. 
how should the Supreme Court review racial classifications? And this is for Lauren in about 40 seconds. Um, I apologize for skipping it. This was, it's all James's fault. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I know people are eager to answer common law questions always. Another five seconds or so. Okay, are you here, um, Lauren? Yes, I am. All right, so Lauren, let's. What's your answer to this one? How should courts review laws that impose or, or, or uh, executive orders that impose a racial classification? I said with rigid scrutiny. Okay, what does that mean, rigid scrutiny? It means um, that they have to take an extra hard, careful look at it. It's not automatically unconstitutional, but so would you say? Would you say that a racial classification is given a presumption of constitutionality? In other words, does the court presume that a racial classification is valid because the other branches adopted it? I would say yes. They presume it's mostly constitutional, but they're looking for a reason, almost. Well, but is that is that a presumption? I mean, maybe then I wouldn't go as far to say as it's a presumption of constitutionality. Okay, all right. I think I think you mostly got it. Okay, good. Thank you, Lauren. All right. So here's the trick with this case, right? The same order can be looked at in two different angles, right? So the first angle is. Does the president have the authority to do this? All right? Does the president have the authority to do this? Um, does the Constitution give him this power? Did Congress give it to him expressly? Or did Congress give it to him impliedly? The questions of whether Congress gave him this power are looked at through the Youngstown framework. You know, it's not, Youngson had not been decided yet, but it's the same idea, right? Is there constitutional authority? And is there statutory authority? None of that turns on race and racial classifications, right? The Youngstown framework is about structure. It's about power, right? Does the president have this power? But this wasn't just a military order in the abstract. It was a military order that had a racial classification to it and that only applied to people of Japanese ancestry. And the court says that racial classifications are viewed strict, uh, rigidly or strictly, we'll say later, what we call strict scrutiny. The discussion of whether you have a racial classification that's um, unconstitutional is separate from the question of whether the president has the power. So it's a, it's a very um, weird analysis. Let me see if I can put this together back to back. I think you answered the question number two, right? Um, is that you're in zone one. About half of you got that right. Uh, Congress expressly ratified the president's order. And I think you had definitely have implied authorization. I don't think you're in a zone of twilight there. I think you have express authorization um, in Korematsu. Uh, the court upheld it. I think it's easily zone one. Uh, they were quite deferential. But question number three talks about rigid scrutiny, or might be called strict scrutiny. Um, the racial classification is not presumptively constitutional, but the delegation of power is presumptively constitutional. So check this out for a minute. The same order might survive Youngstown, 
but fail the rigid scrutiny of equal protection. Let me say that one more time. The exact same order might be within the president's authority, but because it has a racial classification, it's void. It can go the other way. Perhaps the law has a valid racial classification, but the president lacks the authority to do it. When you think about constitutional law problems, you have to look at it from two angles, which is the nature of this course. First, power. Does the president have this power? And second, does it infringe on rights? Does it have a uh, classification that goes against Japanese people? Right? Every issue from here on out in this semester has to be looked at in both of these angles. Um, Korematsu can be taught as an executive power case. Korematsu could also be taught as a structure, I'm sorry, as a as an equal protection case, right? About rights, about you, about discrimination. So the exact same case has two different angles. Um, the the um, I'm sorry, the, the Korematsu case was in 1944. This was before Brown versus Board of Education and a lot of the cases involving racial discrimination. This was well before it. So the court didn't have the sort of developed scrutiny, right? It's developed framework to understand racial discrimination. That just wasn't a thing yet. Uh, only Justice, it was Justice Murphy who said this violates legal protection. But the court was hinting that when you have a racial classification, it's presumptively unconstitutional. Okay, so again, the answer to I think question number two is zone one. I think you're. In, I don't think you're in twilight. I think you're in zone one. And the answer to number two, or I sorry, number three is either rigid scrutiny or what will be called strict scrutiny. I'll accept, accept both answers. Uh, Lainey, I think your hand was up for a bit, uh, but then I saw it dropped. Um. Yeah, this just messes up the entire premise of this being zone one. Because when I read the facts in uh, which case? Youngstown or Korematsu? Korematsu. Well, so about executive order number, we keep talking about order 9066. Yeah. But then the military commander issued a, pro- a public proclamation. Right. Then came executive order number 9102. So there were like 30 some orders in between. And then I have in my notes is when Congress issued their legislation. So I thought they were backing up executive order 9102 that they had not ever backed up executive order 9066. I get your frustration. Um, I think this is a case where the president acted and the, and the Congress was on the same page. Uh, keep in mind, we had a declaration of war and Congress enacted a number of statutes that seemed to give the president the power to do what he wanted. Um, also, those camps weren't paying for themselves. Uh, Congress is appropriating money to pay for the camps. Um, this is not like Youngstown where Congress said, no, we will not give you this power. And they withheld it. Here, the president did it, and Congress seems to go along with it. Uh, so could Congress be furnishing the money, be the implied I think so. authorization? Oh, I think that's an easy case, yeah. If Congress is paying for the relocation, the school buses, the, 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 the tents, you know, all the other things that to pay for, that, in my mind, is not even implied. That's express. I think implied is just sort of passing statutes like in the ballpark, but they're paying for it. Oh man, that's pretty express in my in my view. But it can be an action like that. It doesn't have to be legislation that says you don't need one to one statute. It's not it's not that stringent, which is why what you'll see is a, is the first zone swallows the other ones. I don't think this is twilight. I think this is pretty clear that Congress is on the same page as the president. That makes sense, lady. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Other questions on that? Okay. All right. Very good. Um, all right. Again, so when you think about um, the Korematsu case, you're going to have to think about it in two different lights. You have to think about the case about power, 
has Congress given the president this power? Has the Constitution given this power? It's a powers case. And you also have to think about it in terms of rights. Um, is this a law that deprives people of their due process of law? Right? Are they being deprived of liberty? Um, is this a case that involves uh, uh, segregation, right? unconstitutional classifications on the basis of race? Um, the same order might have a presumption of constitutionality under Youngstown, but not a presumption of constitutionality under the um, under the what's called the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment. We'll get to that later this semester. All right. Any other questions on that on that issue? Can we move on? Yeah? Okay, we'll move on. All right. Uh, we're moving on to a topic that is called the separation of powers. The separation of powers. Um, we've talked about this before. There is no separation of powers clause in the Constitution, right? There's no clause that says the powers shall be separate, right? Uh, th it's not. I think the Texas Constitution has a similar provision. Other state constitutions do, but our federal constitution does not. Um, without question, the Constitution describes separate powers, that the Congress has their powers, the executive has its powers, and the courts have their powers. And it defines them in separate articles, but it doesn't actually say that the powers are separate. Um it doesn't say whether the branches can share their power. You know, for example, could the president give his power to prosecute to someone else? Or can the Congress take away the president's power and put it in the hands of an independent counsel? Or can Congress take away the court's powers and decide cases through administrative agencies, right? The text of the Constitution doesn't get you home. It doesn't answer all of those questions. Um, it does give some guidance of how the branches interact. So for example, how does a bill become a law? It passes the House, it passes the Senate, the president can sign it, or he can veto it. And if the president vetoes a bill, right? If the president vetoes a bill, the Congress can override the veto. That's one area where um, the, the Constitution spells out with some specificity how the branches interact. Another area where the Constitution spells out with specificity how the branches interact is what's called the appointment power. The appointment power. Okay, so if you go on the class notes, scroll down a little bit, Article 2, Section 2. I'll read it to you. Article 2, Section 2. And it says, I'll, I'll do the, the dreaded screen share. I, I hate it, but sometimes I need to. Okay. It says, The president shall nominate and bind with the advice and consent of the Senate shall appoint ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States, comma. I'll come back to the comma later. Um, the president can't fill positions by himself. He merely makes the nomination. At that point, the Senate must give its advice and consent. Um, that's understood to mean the Senate votes on the nominee. We'll have a, oh God, another Supreme Court confirmation hearing about two weeks or so. Lord help us. Oh, this, this fall just keeps getting worse and worse and worse for, for my schedule. Just, it's, it's, not, it's not pretty. Um, advise and consent of the Senate. And you can appoint certain types of officers, ambassadors, ministers, and consuls. These are diplomatic officials, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States. 
Okay. Oh, excuse me. The phrase advise and consent uh, generally means a majority vote in the Senate. Uh, the House has no role whatsoever in the appointments process. All right, the House has no role over the appointments process. But then we get down to the second half of the sentence. It says, but the Congress may by law, by law means by statute, the Congress may by law vest the appointment of such inferior officers as they think proper in the president alone in the courts of law or in the heads of department. Okay, so now we get complicated, right? There are certain types of officers that have to go through the advising consent process. The Senate votes on them. And there are other officers that aren't as important. They're called inferior officers. We have an inferiority complex, maybe. And the inferior officers can be appointed by the president by himself. He can appoint them unilaterally. The courts, think of like a clerk of court, right? The, the clerk of courts is appointed by the court. Or the heads of departments. So the secretary of the treasury, right? The secretary of state, they can appoint their own subordinates. Not all Physicians are appointed by the president through the Senate. Some can be done without the president's involvement at all. So the Constitution speaks of inferior officers. And generally the opposite of an inferior officer is what's called a principal officer. This isn't entirely clear from the text. The Appointments Clause does not use the word principal officers. That's just not there. But it's understood that the principal officers are required to be confirmed by the Senate. And inferior officers can be appointed without the Senate by either the courts or by the heads of department or the president by himself. All right, everyone get that. The appointment process is very important, and I'll just make this contemporary. Um, the Senate is not obligated to do anything. Um, the president can make a nomination, and the Senate can just sit on it and do nothing. Or the Senate can vote on it in two weeks. It's a political choice. Uh, the name Merrick Garland may ring a bell from a couple of years ago. He was President Obama's nominee to the Supreme Court in 2016. At the time, a lot of law professors said, oh my God, the Senate has an obligation to vote on a nominee in election year. And Republicans said, no, there, there's no not obligation, well, whatever. It's a political decision, right? The Constitution says nothing. The Senate can vote or not vote. It's actually really simple. Um, and now we're dealing with the exact opposite. Everyone's just flipped around saying, no, we need a vote. No, we don't need a vote. You know, it's, 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 the, same, it's the same business. Uh, politics is there. But the Constitution, all it says is the Senate has a choice. They can do something or they can do nothing. It doesn't really, um, it does not really matter. Okay. Questions on the appointment power. I see there's something in the chat. Um, Laura asks, recall the appointment clause or power? Uh, both. It's sometimes called the appointments clause um, it's sometimes called the appointment power. I think I'll do. I'll use both of them. I don't. It's interchangeable. So the answer, to Laura, is both. But good question. All right. So that's the appointment power. The appointment clause that tells you how you get someone into an office. How do you get someone out of an office? Right. How do you get someone out of an office? Well, they could die. Right. Or they could resign. I know this sounds stupid, but deathly resignations happen. I mean, my God, just Justice Ginsburg passed like a week ago. Uh, death happens. Um, you know, even a, a job with life tenure doesn't extend beyond uh, a, a life. Although some of a funny story, um, not funny, but it, it happens. The, the Ninth Circuit was a, is a court of appeals based in California, and they had this strange policy. What happens if a judge uh, voted on a case? but died before the opinion was issued. In other words, 
the judges agreed, yes, this is the majority opinion, and then it took a few months to write the opinion, and he died before the opinion came out. The Ninth Circuit had this bizarre rule that said even if a judge voted on a case and then died, you would still count his vote. <laughs> so basically, judges can vote from the grave, right? You know, because they were locked in. Um, the Supreme Court said, no, 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 no. Life tenure means life. It doesn't mean afterlife. You can't, you can't, you know, weaken at Bernie's that, right? If you're saw the movie, you, you can't um, have a have a dead. Weekend at Bernie's was a movie from the 80s. We had a guy who's dead, but they pretend he was alive. It's, it was the 80s. Um, uh, there are no ghost votes, Cassidy says. You have to be alive to cast a vote. Um, as we all know from the beloved Chief Justice, votes are not final to the end. That votes can always change at any given point. So I think it's a mistake to think that casting a vote at a preliminary conference is the same thing as casting a vote for permanent. So the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do it. No more dead votes. You're probably right. Okay, but how do you get someone out of an office, right? So a person can die, which happens. They can resign. You know, you can't force them to stay in the office. And when the position becomes vacant, then the president can fill it with uh, someone else. But what if the person doesn't die? And what happens if the person refuses to resign? Even if the president says, I want you to step down, the person's like, nope, not going to do it. Well, in any business or I guess even a school, you have the power to remove someone, right? Your boss can fire you. Uh, if any of you decide to go you know, cheat on an exam, you might get thrown out of school, right? If any of you has a snack without wearing a mask, maybe we expelled. I don't know what the hell's going on. I haven't been in the building in six months, but you know, uh, or looking at me, uh, you know, the school reserves the right to uh, discipline by expelling you. Uh, so you would think in any organization, the removal power is very important. Very important, right? That if someone's in an office and the president doesn't want them in that office anymore, then the president can remove the person. You think this is really important. But constitution kind of left that one open so take a look at question number four please which provision of the constitution authorizes the president to remove principal officers <sighs> the blank clause Fill in the blank. And I think next up is uh, Seth, who's been waiting patiently for a while. I'll call you about 20 seconds. All right. All right, Jeff. What's your answer here? Oh. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. I put executive. Just, it's not a clause, I don't think. No, it's not a clause. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Specifically, I, I don't know. Because I, I know Scalia was talking a lot about I mean, even though he was the dissenting opinion, he was just talking a lot about uh, the fact that, like, if you really have the executive power in the executive, it implies that they can control all, like, those... Well, which clause was Scalia forces. talking about? Maybe that might be a good way to get you started, Seth. Which which clause was Scalia talking about? Uh, the appointments. Clause. The appointments clause? What other clause was Scalia talking about? Um... And was it the impeachment clause? No. Well, it's not me. Second. Um, Which clause Seth gives the president's powers? Uh, the first, Article Two, Section One. And what does Article Two, Section One say? 
Um, Here, I'll, I'll help you. So, oh. Executive power shall be vested in the president of the United States there of America. There we go. All right, so let me, I'll put it on the screen one second, uh, Seth. So it says the executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America. What does that provision mean? Oh, the vesting clause. Um, yes, the, okay, that's where it's called. It's called the vesting yeah. clause. That, that's sorry. what I thought you were getting at before. Sorry. That's that's what I meant. I, 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 knew, I knew that's what you meant. I, 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 I We read your mind, right? What does the vesting clause actually do, uh, Seth? It vests the executive power in a president of the United States. And what does that executive power include? Uh, a lot of stuff. <laughs> Oh God! On the exam, a lot of stuff. Yeah, uh, uh, I mean, you're not wrong. Uh, you're not wrong. I mean, just be a little bit more, a little more precise, and I'll let you off the hook. A lot of stuff. Well, <laughs> I mean, the executive power would be to enforce the laws. Okay, now we're getting closer. All right, now we're getting closer. All right, um, who's next? Uh, uh, Smee, how are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, what was your answer to this question? I'm embarrassed because I think it's wrong, but I put the removal power. Well, that was what the question was asking for, right? The uh, what power gives you the power to remove? I'm asking for a clause name. I mean, what clause? Would it be the executive? Well, that that's what that's what um, Seth said a minute ago. I'm looking for something a little bit different, a different clause. He said that's with executing the law. I thought the president wasn't allowed to remove principal officers because doesn't doesn't the your book talk about how Nixon wanted somebody to he wanted them to fire the lawyer but he wasn't allowed to. So well, that to... was because of some regulations in effect. That wasn't because of the Constitution. But what clause of the Constitution gives this power? The appointment clause. I mean, is it? I just read it to you. Does the appointments clause say anything about removal? No. No. So is there no cause? Oh, man. I don't know. Doug Douglas, what do you think? So I'm, I'm going out on a limb, and I'm going to try to put two and two together. Okay, is that's good. Take, is it the take care clause? It is. Okay, because it, it is. has to do whatever it takes to, in his mind, faithfully execute the laws. Nailed it. Exactly right. Thanks, Doug. No, that's exactly right. And this is not obvious at all. And the courts don't even say this clearly. Um, a couple of you put necessary and proper, which is a fascinating answer. It's wrong. But it's a fascinating answer because the necessary and proper clause and the take care clause are very similar. right? The necessary and proper clause gives Congress sort of implied powers to carry into execution the foregoing powers, right? They could uh, buy horses and wagons to build postal roads, right? So you don't have an express power to buy horses, but sort of this uh, uh, power to execute. The, the take care clause um, functions in a very similar capacity. It says that the president shall have the power to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. It's Article 2, Section 3. Uh, the take care plus is the present shall have the power to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. Um, and I could teach you an entire semester on what that clause means. There's so much history there. But at a minimum, the president to execute the laws, he has to be able to do certain things. And what if the president decides that a subordinate, that someone in a position of power, is frustrating his ability to execute the law, right? That the subordinate's not executing the law properly. In order for the president to ensure the law is being faithfully executed, he needs people who can follow his commands. And if, let's say, you have a secretary of whatever who's disobeying the president who says, you know what? I disagree, I'm going to do X, I'm not going to do Y. The president is unable to do his duty. So the power to remove is basically 
implied, if you will, implied from the take care clause. It's not express grant of power, but I think you can view the take care clause in a very similar light as you view the necessary and proper clause. The necessary and proper clause gives Congress implied powers, and the take care clause gives the president certain implied powers. Right? Again, this is not obvious from the text. You're not going to see a removal clause, which is why a lot of you put removal power clause. That's not a clause. There's, there's no clause. But everyone get the take care clause argument. This is not like obvious, but I think this is what the courts have generally agreed upon. Okay, so uh, Rachel, are you here? Hi. Rachel, so let me ask you a question, right? We have this federal constitution that has these very detailed rules of how to appoint officers. How could it be that the framers didn't mention the obvious outcome, right? If you can appoint someone, you can fire someone. That's usually understood, right? How could it be that our constitution is silent on this really, it seems, essential element? Um, was it thought that it was implied that if someone has the power to appoint, they have the power to remove? Oh, I think you're right. But but why would you leave that to chance, right? You know, why would you, you know, let me, let me ask the question differently, Rachel. Can the president appoint people by himself unilaterally? Uh, only in a recess appointment, but no, I mean, not. Can the president appoint the Secretary of Treasury by himself? Just say, you know what, I want my, 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 my sister or my, my wife to the Secretary of the Treasury. Can the president do that by himself? No, Senate needs to confirm it. Ah, so Rachel says the Senate must confirm the appointment. Rachel, is it insane to think that the Senate also has to confirm removal? No, perfectly logical. Might make sense, right? So Rachel says, how could it be that the president must go to the Senate to appoint in the first instance, uh, but he can then remove by himself? Uh, uh, Shawnee, did I say it right? Yeah, I said it right. Yes, it's only took me four weeks. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so Shawnee, let me ask you a question. Let's say that, you know, you're President John Adams, right? And you come into office, you're the second president. And you have all these holdover George Washington people. And you don't like the Washington people. You're stuck with them, right? You didn't appoint them. You had no role in appointing them. He was the first president. You're number two. Um, can you just fire all the holdover Washington people? No. Why not? Because I guess this goes back to the accountability thing. Oh. Um, there's some sort of like check and balance that needs to be accounted for. So, Shawnee, let me ask you a question. Could Congress pass a statute that says if you want to fire the Secretary of Treasury or whatever, you need to go to the Senate for a vote. In other words, you have to get the Senate to confirm any uh, appointment side and you need the Senate to give its permission on the removal side. Would such a statute be constitutional? Could Congress condition termination on a vote from the Senate? In other words, could Congress require you to go to the Senate vote before you fire someone? Sure. Sure. Um, I mean, I guess that's like their way of holding, like, or that's their way of like holding the Senate accountable. Is that consistent with our case today, Morrison? No. Um, no. Did Morrison say that the Senate can block removal of anyone they want? Mm -mm. Hmm. All right, Sean, thank you. All right, so we're seeing here, I think, the sort of um, wrinkle in the Constitution where you need to go through all these hoops to appoint someone. You need to get the Senate's permission. But the Constitution is silent on what it takes to fire someone. Now, the Supreme Court didn't really 
address this issue until the 1920s, right? The Supreme Court didn't really need to address this issue until the 1920s. But the political branches engage in this issue very quickly. Um, your reading for today was Morrison versus Olson. The case from was it 1988 or 89. Um, you're reading for next class. Oh, by the way, uh, if you're celebrating Yom Kippur on Monday, I have a meaningful fast, but I will not be here. Um, uh, our, our reading for Wednesday uh, is a case called Sila Law, which was decided about four months ago. Uh, students hate reading new cases. Oh, I didn't read this new case. It's not in the book. I don't have to read it. Oh, yeah, you have to read it. Uh, so, so just suck it up. Um, but both Morrison v. Olson and Sila Law uh, we're trying to trace the history of this removal power. And the majority opinion, the dissenting opinions, don't agree on much. But there are certain historical events that are worth discussing. Um, the first incident came in 1789. That was the first year that our Congress met, right? The very first year that Congress assembled, the very first session of Congress. And we have something called a decision of 1789. The decision of 1789, here was a setup. The House and the Senate were having a debate. And the question was this, could Congress pass a bill that um, restricted their removal power? Right? In other words, could the Senate pass a bill that says you need Senate consent to fire someone? Um, the House didn't favor that. The House representative said that the president has removal power and that can't be limited by the Senate. The Senate actually divided evenly. Right? They, they tied. They couldn't really decide. Um, Half the members thought that the removal power was absolute. And the other half thought that the Senate could limit the removal power, that you need the Senate's permission to fire someone. What happens when there's a tie in the Senate? The vice president, John Adams, breaks the tie vote in favor of George Washington. So uh, according to some scholars, there was a precedent set fairly early that Congress did not have the power to restrict the removal power. Um, this incident from 89 is somewhat debated, and I don't want to get into the debate now. I think you'll see it in seal of law, but keep this decision of 1789 in mind, right, um, over whether the Senate could restrict the removal power. Um, fast forward to after the Civil War. Uh, we know President Lincoln was assassinated uh, after his second term began. And after Lincoln was assassinated, President Andrew Johnson, I'm sorry, Vice President Johnson became president. Now, Johnson had a problem. He was stuck with all of Lincoln's holdover officers. Right, All the holdover Lincoln people were, were still in the cabinet. And Johnson wanted to fire them. For example, we want to fire the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. But there was a statute called the Tenure of Office Act. The Tenure of Office Act. And the Tenure of Office Act said for the president to fire the Secretary of War, the Senate had to vote for it. In other words, the president could fire unilaterally. At the time, the Senate would not have voted for it. They liked Lincoln's guy. They did not like Johnson very much. So at that point, Johnson basically said, screw this. The Tenure of Office Act is unconstitutional. He didn't go to the court. He said, I'm not going to follow it. And he fired Secretary Stanton. This created a huge crisis. Stanton locked himself in his office and he refused to leave. Literally, he refused to go. He's like, he, he, you're going to fire me? Come and take it, right? You got you and my army. I'm the Secretary of War. And he refused to leave. 
Eventually, they worked it out. He left. It was a it was a compromise, but there was a huge crisis at the time because the president said leave, and he's like, "I'm not leaving. I'm protected by the statute. My tenure is protected by the statute." Okay. Um, but that wasn't the end of the situation. Congress impeached President Johnson on a number of grounds. And one of the grounds of impeachment was that, that President Johnson violated the Tenure of Office Act. Right? They impeached him for violating the Tenure of Office Act. This was a huge deal. Uh, Johnson was impeached in the House. And the Senate held a trial. As you know, the Chief Justice presides during a presidential impeachment trial. In the Senate, you need two-thirds to convict, two-thirds votes. The Senate was one vote short of conviction. One senator changed his mind and voted to acquit and to not remove the president as a result of Johnson stayed in office. But who was right in the Constitution? Was Johnson correct that he had this absolute removal power? Or was the Congress correct that they could restrict the removal power? So again, you have these two instances where the elected branches are fighting over an issue. You have the decision of 1789. And you have this um, conflict over the Tenure of Office Act after the Civil War. All right, so who was right? Was Johnson right or was the Congress right? Fast forward to another case called Myers versus United States. Myers versus United States. I think it's 1925. I'm blanking on the year. Uh, 1926. Oh, so close. 1926. Uh, Control F helps very quickly. Um, Myers involved nothing as sensational as a civil war. It involved something kind of boring. Um, involved the postmaster. Who the hell cares about the postmaster? Let me tell you, before the internet, that was a damn important position. Uh, the postmaster is responsible for uh, uh, transferring all mail in a certain area. And Congress had enacted protections for the postmaster that he could not be fired, right? His tenure was secure. President, <laughs> excuse me. President Wilson comes in. He tells the postmaster, thank you for your service. Your services are no longer needed. And the postmaster says, uh-uh, I am not going. I have a statute that protects my tenure. You cannot fire me. This case goes to the Supreme Court. Um, the Chief Justice is William Howard Taft. He was the former president. And he writes an opinion that vigorously says that the president has removal power. And it strongly hints that president's power cannot be limited, that this is an absolute power that Congress cannot control. So Myers, in 1926, suggests that the president has this absolute rule power. By the way, these are cases that you, you need to know. Um, they're all mentioned. Uh, so I hope you're, you're taking good notes on these. All right, so that's 1926 about whether the president has an absolute removal power. I have another case for you. Um, I could assign these cases, but they're just too long. They're too many, so I have to summarize them. Uh, the next case is in 1935. A case is called Humphrey's Executor, uh, H-U-M-P-H-R-E-Y-S, Humphrey's Executor. Uh, why is it called Humphrey's Executor? Because Humphrey died. <laughs> Let me aside. Uh, Humphrey died when the case to be litigated. This is a funny story. Uh, so in this case, you had a guy named Humphrey, who was a commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission. Humphrey had been appointed by a Republican president, Herbert Hoover. Um, he had a fixed position for a number of years. When President Roosevelt came into office, Roosevelt, Roosevelt said, thank you, your services are no longer needed. He didn't give a rationale. He didn't explain why. He said, yep, I don't need you anymore. Go away. And Humphrey's like, screw you. I'm not resigning. 
So Roosevelt said, fine, I'll fire you. And then went to litigation. Uh, while the litigation was pending, Humphrey died. So actually the case became his estate was suing for a salary he would have gotten from the position. Now, this is a funny story. A couple of years ago, I made a joke like, yeah, I bet Roosevelt had him killed. Uh, I, was, I was mostly joking. Uh, but someone, because God bless YouTube, was watching and actually he sent me a copy of Humphrey's death certificate. He died of a, of, of a coronary issue in his heart. So he was not killed by Roosevelt. Uh, but God bless YouTube. Uh, people do this sort of thing. Uh, if you ever come to my office, if you're ever allowed to again, um, I have a copy of his death certificate in my office. Anyway, so Humphreys was this commissioner of the FTC. Now, what the heck is the FTC? The FTC is the Federal Trade Commission. This was an agency created by Congress that was sort of different. Um, it was not headed by a single director or department head. It set at a five-member board. Three members were part of the president's party. So you would have three Democrats and you have two members who were the um, minority party. So, so two Republicans, right? It's a very strange structure, but it's designed to have sort of independence from the political process. The most important part is that the commissioners on the FTC have fixed terms, five years or whatever it happens to be. Uh, the president can only fire the commissioners for specific reasons, um, neglect, abuse of office, and a few other things, right? They have to screw up. Um, FDR, though, didn't allege there was any abuse of office. He simply said, I don't want you here anymore. Go away. Now, the question was, could Congress restrict the removal power for these uh, trade commissioners, so we get to 1935, and as you probably recall, 1935, the Supreme Court was still ruling against President Roosevelt. This is before 37. And the court unanimously, 9-0, rules that President Roosevelt violated the Constitution. And the court upheld the tenure protections that protected Humphreys. It's called for cause protection, which means you can only fire him for some cause. You can't fire him at will. Now, the opinion Humphrey's executor, I don't want to focus too much on because it's basically overruled. It doesn't really have any relevance anymore. But what the court said in Humphrey's was you have these positions that are sort of hybrid, right? A trade commissioner is not just executive. It's quasi-legislative and quasi-judicial. What does that mean? Well, the commissioner can make rules, regulations, which is kind of like a statute, not really. So it's this quasi-legislative position. And the commissioners can also adjudicate. They can decide disputes within their agency. So there's their quasi-judicial. The court made this sort of distinction between um, purely executive positions, like the Secretary of the Treasury, and these quasi-legislative and quasi-judicial positions. So if you're purely executive, the president can fire you absolutely. But if you have these quasi-powers, like quasi-legislative, quasi-judicial, Congress can restrict removal power. Okay? So you have, again, the decision of 1789... You have the Tenure of Office Act dispute after the Civil War. You have Myers against the United States in 1926. And you have Humphrey's executor in 35. So all these cases concern the removal power. And they don't exactly line up. Myers seems to suggest that this power is absolute. And then Humphrey's executor seems to suggest that no, it's not. That the removal power is only for these purely executive positions. If it's quasi-legislative, quasi-judicial, it's within the Congress's power to restrict it. Okay, I think that's the history. That gets us almost to Morrison against Olson. <sighs> okay. Questions on that history. I'm sorry to lecture so much, but it's there's a lot there, a lot of American history to think about.
Okay, let's actually go on then to Morrison against Olsen. Uh, who's next? Oh, we go back up to the top. Okay, who's next? Uh, Isela, are you here? Yes, I'm here. All right, Isela, you want to please give me the facts in Morrison against Olsen, please? So this was, so they, it was like, so there was an act of the Title VI of the Ethics and Government Act, which mm-hmm. Congress, like, uh, came out to. And so where they could pretty much, um, it was like pretty much gives, like they appoint a private investigator and a private like officer uh, for the court filing. And so, um, so they submitted, so pretty much that Olsen, I think it was Olsen, yeah. No, it was Morrison. Olsen had lost, like there was, uh, that he allegedly allied um, in a congressional committee. And so they investigated it. And after the investigation, uh, they submitted the report to the attorney general. And um, they had said that Olson had violated the law. And so then that triggered the act of the Title VI of the Ethics in Government. And they appointed the, in, like, the independent counsel. And so the question was, whether um, they could, whether Congress through this act um, have like someone and an uh, independent counsel come in and do the private investigations. All right, Isela, let me ask you a follow up question, please. Generally, if there's an allegation of crime, what's the process for investigating? What's the Generally, forget the ethics and government. What's, if there's some allegations of this criminal activity, who is doing the investigation? How does it happen? So it has to go through, um, like, the attorney general. Good. And who's the attorney so, general work for? For the president. Okay. Why do you think Congress decided to enact this sort of workaround where it wouldn't only be the attorney general, that the other branches would be involved? Um, maybe because Congress wants to say. Um, okay. But what, what 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 happened that you know maybe Congress no longer trusted the president to investigate in cases like this. So it started with the Watergate scandal Good. when Nixon was in office. Good. So that's that last question. I'll move on. Why might Congress not have trusted the president to investigate Olson? Why might there be a concern there. Who was Olson? Olson was he was the assistant attorney general, so um, why might there be some concern about, about the attorney general investigating Olson? Well, I, I mean that's a close connection. I would say like a close relationship. There you go. Conflict of interest, right? Very good. Thanks, Isella, right? Um, the reason why we have this or, or had, I should say, this Ethics and Government Act provision is because of concerns of conflicts of interest. Right? The president appoints the attorney general and the president also selects the assistant attorney generals. The allegation was the assistant attorney general lied and maybe committed a crime. So there was a concern that Maybe the attorney general will go easy in his own guy, right? That the executive branch cannot be trusted to investigate itself. Therefore, we need something else. We need to erect this elaborate structure, this this complicated multi-step process, which you know, confuses students every semester to avoid this possible conflict of interest. Uh, So conflict, uh, conflict, uh, Congress creates this statute, this this independent council provision. Um, It's called the independent council statute or the independent council provision. You call it different things. But it creates a way to force an investigation 
even if the Attorney General may not want to do it on his own. All right. Uh, Rachel, are you here? Yes, I'm here. All right, Rachel, uh, could you please walk us through the process of how an independent counsel was appointed? And by the way, this statute was, was, is no longer in effect. It was sort of, it wasn't repealed. It was what's called sunsetted as after some of years. It just, it, it just fades away. But how did this process work here, uh, Rachel? Um, I believe they were appointed by the attorney general. And then... What, 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 what triggered the appointment, right? In other words, was this the attorney general on his own deciding to appoint someone? No. Um, they have to, I think it's, they have to say that um, they start an investigation and then they decide. And I believe it's, it was the committee um, in Congress decided that it was necessary and it's appointed by the attorney general. Okay, good. So I'll come back to you in a second, Rachel. The first step is that the public or members of Congress can submit a report to the attorney general that says, um, we think that there was some criminal activity. Now, usually the attorney general can say, yes or no, I don't care, I don't care. But under the statute, he had an obligation. He has to decide, is there reasonable grounds to investigate further? Is that warranted? And if the answer is yes, he must proceed to the next step. Now, let me tell you, there are always reasonable grounds to investigate. You know, the feds can investigate anything, 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 anything. So this first step was almost automatic. But it's not discretion, right? Usually the attorney general could say, in my discretion, I don't think this is a good use of resources, or this is not very important, or let's focus on bigger fish. But the statute forces him to exercise his discretion. Okay, so then Rachel, what's the second step? After the attorney general, the AG says that there's reasonable grounds to investigate further, what happens next? Um, I believe that it has to be approved. Um, it's all right. Uh, Alyssa, you here? What happens after the Attorney General makes that first determination? What happens next? After then, the Act called for a panel of the Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit to appoint an appropriate independent counsel. Is there music or something? Is there music in the background? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Uh, uh, that's okay. Oh, we're, 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 all, we're all home. All right, so let me ask that again. So what happens after the AG makes a determination? What's the next step, Alyssa? Then they uh, make a three-judge panel, a okay. special three-judge panel of the Court of Appeals for the District Court Circuit DC, to appoint yeah. a private independent counsel. Okay, so the a three judge panel of the DC Circuit, which is the federal court in Washington, mm-hmm. appoints an independent counsel. And what does that independent counsel do? Uh, is that where they decide to whether to prosecute the charges? But but who gives the instructions to the independent counsel? Is it the attorney general? To the independent counsel, it would be the judge. The three yes. Judges. Okay, very good. Thank you, Alyssa. So it's this, it's this very weird structure, right? Where the AG basically says, I think there's grounds to investigate, but I'm not going to investigate it myself. We need an independent counsel, but I'm not picking that person. So I'm going to ask a three judge panel, three judges of the Federal Court of Appeals in DC to make that selection. And they select the person. And they also select the person's jurisdiction. Now, I know you think, oh, it's a diversity jurisdiction. Here, jurisdiction means what are they allowed to investigate, right? What are they allowed to investigate? Now, let me tell you, as a practical matter, the panel may give the person a very narrow jurisdiction. 
But over time, as your investigation grows, the person says, you know what? I need more authority. I need to investigate this. I need to talk to this person. And the independent counsel can go back to the court and request further guidance to, to get more jurisdiction. So the initial grant of what to investigate is actually pretty narrow. All right, so we get the idea. So here, the House representatives had a report suggesting that Olson lied. The Attorney General read this report and he said, you know what, I think there's grounds to investigate. Let me look into this further. At that point, the Attorney General asked a three-judge panel to appoint a special independent counsel. And they appointed Alexa Morrison. By the way, um, don't confuse Morrison v. Olson with United States versus Morrison. It's common. Uh, U.S. v. Morrison was about the Violence Against Women Act. Right, this is our Commerce Clause case from a few weeks ago. Morrison v. Olson is about the Independent Council. They're not related, as far as I know. I don't think they are. I think they're related, but uh, they, they, these are different cases. All right. So the Independent Council is appointed, and uh, Morrison issues a subpoena to Olson. Olson says, I am not responding to your subpoena because this is unconstitutional. Whew. Okay. So this case presents several really important separation of powers issues. Um, the vote was eight to one. Uh, Justice, I, I'm sorry, it was seven to one. Justice Kennedy was not yet uh, on the court when it was argued. The vote was seven to one. So this was pretty lopsided. Um, Justice Scalia wrote a very famous dissent. Um, and a lot of people, myself included, think that Scalia got this one uh, right. Um, but it was only a dissent. Um, you'll see in CELA Law, the case decided in 2020, uh, Chief Justice Roberts wrote a majority opinion that barely acknowledged Scalia's dissent. And I think that's unfortunate because Scalia's dissent spoke to a generation for a very long time. Um, but this was an, a 7 to 1 case, it was pretty lopsided. All right. Um, so there were three separate issues that the court had to grapple with. There were three separate issues the court had to grapple with. Um, the first issue concerns the appointment of the independent counsel. Uh, the president didn't appoint the independent counsel. The attorney general did not appoint the independent counsel. The independent counsel was appointed by a special court, a three-judge panel. Okay, so uh, Joseph, you here? Yes. All right, Joseph, let me ask you this question, please. How come this three-judge panel is allowed to appoint an independent counsel, according to the majority, right? What allows them to make this appointment? Um, they decided that she was classified as an inferior officer. Ah, okay. So, Joseph, let's take a look at the text of the appointments clause, right? I had it on the screen before. I'll put it on the screen again. What does it matter whether it's a principal or an inferior officer? Why does that matter? Uh, You're right. I mean, give me a correct answer. Why does it matter whether the uh, Morrison's principal or inferior? Because this Congress uh, made by law best Good. appointment of such inferior officers. Where? As they, as they think proper in the as alone in the courts of law. In the courts of law. So, uh, thank you, uh, Joseph. So, if Morrison is an inferior officer, if Morrison's an inferior officer, then she can be appointed by the courts. Right? Uh, Jack, you here? Jack? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so Jack, let me ask this question, please. What happens if Morrison's not inferior? What if she's principal? 
What if she, what if she was a principal officer? Could she be appointed is by she, the courts? No, she could not be appointed by the courts if she was a principal officer. Who would have to appoint her and nominate her? Um... The executive branch? The president? Yes, exactly right. The president... Okay? The president gets to appoint the principal officers, but the courts appoint the um, inferior officers. So, Jack, let me ask you this follow-up question, please. How do we decide if an officer is principal or if an officer is inferior. How do we how do we distinguish the two? Where, where do we where do we get this from? So, um, according to the majority, an inferior officer would be. Um, they say that an inferior officer would be first subject to removal by a higher executive branch official, mm -hmm. and. Then second, they're, uh, they're only empowered by the act to perform certain limited duties. And the independent counsel in this situation um, was restricted to just the one issue. They didn't have a broad range, even though it would last for um, two years, I think, in this situation. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, um, their office as an inferior is limited in their jurisdiction. Okay. So very good, Jack. Thank you. So the majority the majority finds that Alexa Morrison is inferior, and therefore she can be appointed by the courts. And they say, look, this person can be removed by higher office. Um, her jurisdiction is limited. She can only look at certain things. Um, you know, she's basically inferior, right? She's only in the office for a limited period of time. After she does her job, the office goes away. She's no longer going to be uh, working in that position. Uh, so they say, look, she is independent. Uh, I'm sorry, inferior. Uh, Lainey, you here? Good morning, yes, sir. Good morning. Oh, thank you. Good morning to you, too. Um, how does Justice Scalia view Morrison, whether she's inferior or a principal? What does Scalia say? Oh, Scalia says that she is a principal. Okay, how does Scalia reach that conclusion? Um, because, I mean, it just was contradictory to what the majority said. Her scope really wasn't limited, and the tenure really isn't short because these investigations can, as you said, they keep asking for permission to expand their power and they get it to drag on and on and on. Um, and it's, it costs a lot of money. So it's, it's a huge drain on resources. Okay. But, but simply why you're right. It goes on forever, but, but what's the key point? Why does Scalia think that she's not inferior? What's the key? What makes a person inferior or superior according to Scalia? What, what's like the defining characteristic? She wasn't subordinate to any yes. anyone in the executive branch. What does that mean? She's not subordinate to anyone in the executive branch. What does that mean? She didn't have to answer to anybody. She yes. Was principal. Yes. So look, you're all students, right? Um, to some degree, you have to answer to the dean, to me, anyone else. Lainey, did Morrison have to answer to anyone in the executive branch? No. No. Who did you get her instructions from? From the panel. From the court. Who appointed her. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, so here Scalia takes a very different definition of what is inferior and what is principal. Scalia says, look, she's not subject to anyone's discretion in the executive branch. She can do whatever she wants. She only needs to go to the court. And I'll tell you, the court is very permissive in giving this discretion. That's not, that's not their thing. They're not going to fight it. Um. So the majority says principal. I'm sorry, the majority says inferior. And the dissent says principal. Okay, so that's issue number one. The second, the second issue is a little bit different, right? It's not concerned about how she was appointed. It's about what she does. 
So you remember I gave the example earlier of what happens if you have a, um, a secretary who ignores the president. The president says, do X. And the president says, no, no, I'm going to do Y. I, I don't want to do that. So the president says, go one way. The secretary says, go the other way. We say that in that case, the president can fire or remove the secretary uh, because the president has a job to execute the laws. See, the laws are faithfully executed. And if this idiot is getting in his way, he can fire him. Um, Any column here? Colin? Uh, Jessica, are you here? Yes, I'm here. All right, Jessica, let me ask you this question, please. Um, can the president fire the independent counsel for any reason they want at any time? No. No? Well, why not? I'm sorry? They had to have good cause. Very good. What does that mean, good cause? That's exactly right. What does it mean to have uh, good cause? They had to have a, a good reason. Um... I'm not sure it's specified, but uh, yeah, they just have to have a good reason. They couldn't just fire them because they didn't like them or anything. Yeah, so can the president say, you know what, I think this is a waste of resources and I don't like you snooping around with my buddies. Is that a good reason? No. Can the president say, you know what, I think that this is saying the wrong message to the public. I don't want people seeing this, you know, this this uh, this investigation go on. Is that, it? is that a good reason? No. Okay, now Jessica, the last question for you. Who gets to decide whether the reason is good enough, whether there's good cause? Is the president decides by himself? Uh, no, I think it, it, um, the council, the panel. Exactly right. Thank you, Jessica. That's exactly right. If the president fires the special counsel, I'm sorry, the independent counsel for a good cause, uh, Morrison could have gone back to the court and challenged the president's removal. And that's up to the court to decide whether the cause was good enough. This is, a, I mean, this is a huge deal if you think about it, right? That the president can't fire the person unless he persuades three judges and I guess the Supreme Court that he was right. And during this time, the person remains in office investigating as, as he or she sees fit. Uh, Jessica uh, Raymond, what did Justice Scalia think about this good cause removal provision? You hear Raymond? Oh, such a good wind up too. Laura, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, Laura. What did Scalia think about this good cost standard? He obviously dissented. And <laughs> he did, said, yeah. Vigorously. Uh, he it was too limiting to presidential control. Why? In what regard was this was this good cost provision limiting? Because the um the Article 2, Section 1 says the executive power doesn't mean some of the executive power. It means all of it. Right, right. That, that, that's true. But, but specifically, what clause of the Constitution is being restricted here? When, when the good cause provision, what's the clause we said that that's an issue? Okay. We said at the outset of class. Oh, the take care? Good, very good. And what does the take care clause mean in this context? That it would impede on his ability to um, do his job. Right. To execute so, the laws if he couldn't remove this um, annoyance. Yeah, right. That. Annoyance. I like that. Why Why would this annoyance, as you call it, impede his ability to execute the law? Just, just finish the sentence. Well, because they're trying to impeach him and then he wouldn't be able well, to. Well, they they're, not, they're not going after the president. They're going, you know, there's not current day, right? They're going after Olson. You know, who. Oh, you're asking why the president would like that? Yeah. Well, because um, if it was his attorney general that's being investigated, that would probably cause some hiccups for the president. Hiccups? Oh, get, um, give me a good word. What do you mean hiccups? I, I like that word. Um, I feel like the president and the attorney general um, probably work very closely together. Yeah. So if your attorney general is um, being investigated, investigated or in some yeah. trouble that could um, affect your day-to-day -day life as the president. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Okay, thank you, Laura. Um, I like the hiccups. That's a good word, right? If if the independent counsel is investigating the executive branch, it may come close to home. You know, maybe, 
investigating the assistant attorney general. And then the investigation expands, including the attorney general. And then before you know it, the president's implicated in the suit. That's a big deal, right? That's a huge deal. Um, these investigations have a way of taking a life of their own. They always start small. Uh, so, for example, the investigation of President Clinton in the 90s. I'm sure you all know the name Monica Lewinsky. I'm sure you know that name if you don't Google her. I actually met her at a conference years ago. She was very nice. Uh, uh, anyway, she was a White House intern, and you know the rest. Um, but why was there an investigation of a White House intern? The investigation began with something called the Whitewater Land Transactions, that the Clintons were involved in these uh, land purchases in Arkansas that were somewhat shady. I don't, I don't know the specifics. But you somehow went from um, investigating real estate transactions in Arkansas to investigating the president's sexual uh, relations with, a, uh, with an intern. And these things, they take on a life of their own. It, it's really remarkable um, if the courts don't control their jurisdiction. So Scalia says that the, that the limitations on the four cause impede the president's ability to faithfully execute the laws, right? You can't, um, you, you can't put these four cause removal provisions. Okay, everyone okay with this, 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 um, the, the four cause protections? When I say four cause, I mean Morrison can be removed for, for some sort of valid cause found by a court. All right, so the next one is, um, Alejandro, let me ask you this question, please. Um, there's a third issue, right? Alejandro, usually, who's in charge of deciding whether to prosecute someone? Um, the person in charge of deciding if they can prosecute someone? Yeah, who usually gets to decide in, in, in our federal government? whether to prosecute someone or not, whether to investigate someone or not. Uh, a judge? No, no, not a judge. Thankfully, not judges. Who does Who does the prosecution in our federal uh, the, system? Well, it's the government. Um, Be more specific. Well, I guess if it's like a federal case, it would be the federal government. More specific. If it's a case against, or if it's a case against the... Which part of the federal government? Um, I'm not sure. Aloha, I'm sorry, uh, Virginia is next? Virginia, who gets to decide in the federal government who makes a prosecution? Here, Virginia? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, um, is it the Attorney General? Yeah, the Attorney General. Who does the Attorney General work for? President? He works for the president. So, Alejandro, I'm sorry, uh, Virginia, Alejandro, I saw the previous name. Virginia, let me ask you this question, please. If the president and the AG can decide to prosecute or not, um, that's their decision, right? Are they required to prosecute every allegation of criminal activity? No. Why might they decide not to investigate certain criminal activity? Because it benefits their interests or they just, on their discretion, don't find there's merit to oh. warrant. Let's, I'll come back to your first point in a minute. I like your first point that, that, that might affect them. Let's talk about your second point. Why might an attorney general say, we're not going to investigate this? Even though there's maybe criminal activity. A, a, a good reason, like, you know, a neutral reason, not like a bad reason. Um, it's not worth the time. It's yeah. not worth the Yeah, 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 very good. I'll come back to your other reason in a moment. But there's there's completely benign reasons, right? It's a waste of time, right? There may be this like a trivial violation of law and with a lot more important things to do, you know, for example, we're not going to prosecute low-level marijuana offenses because it's kind of stupid, right? But we are going to trash people, you know, who are dealing with fentanyl, right? You can imagine making that decision. That's... I think a good reason. Now you said, I think your first one, I think you said it might affect their interests. Is that how you put it? Yeah. Just, give, it. give me a little bit more. Just expand upon that, please. Um, well, if they work together, you know, close knit, if they're working uh, together, um, they may have uh, 
They may have hidden reasons, nefarious reasons. I don't know. Uh, they may just be in cahoots with each other. So maybe they knew that Olsen lied. Is that what you know? Maybe what happened here? Yeah. yeah. All right. So thank you, Virginia. Very good. Uh, so usually the president and the attorney general have this discretion, and they're accountable, right? Uh, the president stands for election. He's a public official. Um, if there's some criminal activity and he decides not to investigate or not to prosecute, the people who hold him accountable, right? The attorney general says, you know what? I am not going to charge low-level marijuana offenses. Then people can say, you know what? You should charge them. Or if the president says, I am not going to charge my uh, my uh, secretary for fraud, then people can hold him accountable as well, in theory at least. But the Ethics and Government Act eliminates those incentives. It's no longer the Attorney General's decision to decide whether to proceed. So long as there's reasonable ground, which is pretty broad, you appoint the uh, independent counsel. And once the independent counsel is appointed, they're on their own, right? They only need to ask the court for permission, which they will get. Scalia says this doesn't work, right? You can't have these mini attorney generals, right? These junior varsity attorney generals. Um, the executive power in Article 2 belongs to the president, the president alone. And the president only has a decision of whether to choose to investigate and prosecute. Um, Scalia says this entire structure, forget the appointments clause, forget the removal power, the entire nature of having this rogue prosecutor make these investigations violate the separation of powers. Scalia describes very famously that this wolf comes as a wolf. This is not a wolf in sheep's clothing. This is a bad idea and doesn't even try to pretend it's good. This is a terrible idea. Um, but the law is upheld by a vote of seven to one. Uh, many of the things Scalia wrote about um, came to look pretty good in the 90s as Bill Clinton was being investigated for years for real estate transactions and sexual abuse. And uh, in the late 1990s, both Republicans and Democrats agreed that this was a bad idea, that the independent counsel who could do whatever he wants maybe shouldn't have so much authority. And they allowed the law to sunset, which means it just expired. They wouldn't renew it. In 1999, the law just sunset. Uh, now, in its place, Congress didn't enact the statute, but the executive branch put in regulations um, those are the regulations that governed the Robert Mueller investigation, which I really don't want to go into because it's all statutory. It's not based on uh, uh, a congressional act. Um, but a lot of the criticisms of both the Ken Starr investigation and the Mueller investigation, uh, I think, were spelled out with painful clarity with Justice Scalia's dissent. Right. Questions on Morrison? Questions on Morrison. All right. Uh, I'll start the minute poll so you can start typing your answers, but let me uh, just sort of synthesize things a bit for you. Um, when you're thinking about uh, the separation of powers, um, there are a lot of different concepts to keep in mind. You have the appointment power. You have the removal power, which is not really a clause. Um, you also have to keep in mind whether... Some law restricts the president's power to uh, prosecute or intrudes in the executive power. There are not there are not clear guidelines of what violates the separation of powers. Um, you can say, okay, he's principal or inferior. You get the removal appointment power. Uh, you can ask, where's the removal power come from? It's the sort of take care clause. But there's no clear guidance of what the separation of powers means. I know students always have trick, tricks with those, right? There's not a clear answer there. Um, for Scalia, he says the power to prosecute is inherently a political process, belongs to the executive, and the power cannot be taken away from the president and given to these sort of independent officers. All right, questions. 
It's going to be Barrett or Lagoa. I have no idea. We'll, we'll see on Saturday. Uh, I'll be back here. All right, everyone. Thank you all so much. Uh, have a wonderful weekend. I won't see you till actually next Wednesday if you're having a before every meaningful fast. Thank you so much. Can I ask you a question? Uh, yeah, if you need to go, you can go sign off. That's fine. Um, when you were talking in the beginning about um, the uh, removal powers that the president has, I think I may have gotten lost somewhere when you were telling like the history. So where, when you said the president needs Senate approval for his appointments and does not need approval for a removal, that was before, that's not like good law right now, right? I'm talking about the constitution. It says nothing about removal, but it does say you need the Senate consent for a, a appointment, but that's right from the constitution. Okay, so that's that's the constitutional standard, but then what we've seen different... Um, the, the Congress has began putting more and more restrictions on the removal power over the last you know, 200 years. Okay, thank you. Makes sense? Yes, thank All you. Right, thank you so much. All right, everyone, all office hours, about 20 minutes or so. Uh, hope to see you soon, and uh, have a good, a good week.